Now, we'll come to that in a minute. The judge is at the door. In this psalm, we, we are learn- we, this is what partly what I, I meant. I, I said earlier in the, in the West, uh, this is, I said the Protestant West, but I think this is a Western characteristic, Roman Catholic. In the Western uh, tradition, Roman Catholic and Protestant alike, uh, when we think of courts and God as judge, guilt is the thing that comes up. Uh, and that is a biblical theme. That's not unscriptural. But there is this other theme where, at last, vindication is one of the things that comes up. Vindication, I'm going to be justified. It's going to be put right. And when we, as I, I began by saying, we're invited to sing the Psalms. We, we sing, for example, um, uh, Psalm 67. We sing, uh, we sing Psalm 96. We sing Psalm 35. We sing Psalm 98. And we're learning how to think like a plaintiff. We're learning how to think scripturally like a plaintiff. God, would you hear my case? The judge is at the door. He will dry every tear. Revelation 21.4. He will bind up every wound. Psalm 147, verse 3. He will set every bone. He will, he will untie the knots of every treachery. He will reverse the effects of every desertion. Every desertion, every treachery, every double cross, he's going to put it all right. Every disease is going to be sponged away. Every cruelty will be dissolved into nothingness. No unrepentant sinner will be given the power to blackmail the redeemed cosmos out of her joy. If someone refuses to let go of their bitterness, if someone refuses to let go of their complaint, if someone refuses to stop complaining when the judge has arrived, that complainer, that whiner, that moaner is not going to be allowed, not going to be permitted to rob the rest of the redeemed cosmos of her joy. You you don't have to worry about are are the redeemed in heaven going to be upset and not able to enjoy heaven because there are people in hell. That's what I mean. No. The people in hell are clinging to what they insist upon clinging to, and God is not going to permit their rebellion to to be a way of blackmailing the universe. The fatherless will be brought to their everlasting father, and all the pieces of this glorious story will be fitted together, and there will be no remainder. Every little fragment, every little piece of this broken world is going to be reassembled and every last piece is going to have a place to go and there aren't going to be any parts left over. Nothing. Why? Because the judge is at the door. Every quarrel, every falling out, every divorce, every estrangement with a son, every estrangement with a daughter or a mother or a father or an uncle or an aunt, every, every last one of those things, all of it is going to be put right. All of it is going to be put right. And, you, and we think, how can God do, possibly do that? Who does he think he is? Think, listen to yourself. God is God, and God is the judge. And when the judge, rightly understood in his role as a judge, when he's at the door, God's, God's, the, the hearts of God's people leap for joy. That's how we are to think of him. Why? Not because, not because our case is as ironclad as all that, but rather because we are in Christ. Right? Christ, is the, Christ is the judge who's going to do this for us. So here's the question. What do you make of Jesus? What do you make of Jesus? That's going to be the dividing line between the judge as the hanging judge in a criminal case, or the judge who rises up to vindicate you and put everything right where it ought to be. What do you make of Jesus? He was crucified. He was buried. He was raised. He was raised again in the ascension and then enthroned. He is now seated at the right hand of the Ancient of Days, and every creature is summoned to face him. Every creature is summoned into his presence. Every creature comes to look Jesus straight in the face. 
And at that moment, there's only going to be one possible binary choice. You will love or you will not. You will love him or you will not love him. And your best indicator, incidentally, of which way it's going to be is whether or not you love him now. All right? Do you love him now or do you not? Do you follow him now or do you not? Do you do it his way or do you do it your way? So every creature, I don't, I don't know how this is going to work at the last judgment because there are, are a lot of us, but at that moment, at the last judgment, you will be face to face with your judge. You will be face to face with your judge. You will either continue to look him in the face or you will turn away. You're summoned to face him, you're going to refuse to do so, or you will do so. The Latin word, convertere, means to turn around, and it's where we get the word conversion. When someone is converted, they are turned around. When someone is going this way and they convert, they start going the other way. Convert is a 180. If you're running from, if you're running from Christ, if you're running from Jesus, to be converted is to turn around and face him. And want to face him. Face him because you love him. As opposed to being forcefully turned around and then rejecting that and turning away. Our solemn responsibility, starting now, not starting at the last day, but starting now, starting whenever you hear the gospel preached, our solemn responsibility is to turn and face Christ. Turn and face Christ. If we do, if we turn then we're going to be looking on the one who was pierced. If we, we will see him. And that means we will see the judge who undertakes on our behalf. If you turn to face Christ, if I say, which way will you go? Will you continue to run away or will you turn and face Christ? If you turn to face Christ, you are facing the judge. If you re refuse to turn to face Christ, you're running away from the judge. Christ is the judge in either case. When you turn and face him, you are facing the judge who vindicates. When you run from him, you are facing the judge who judges. We can know that Christ is the one who undertakes on our behalf because when we turn and face him, we're looking at the judge who undertook past tense on our behalf. He is the one, we're looking on the one who was pierced. We're looking on the one who who had a spear run into his side 2,000 years ago. We're looking on the one who had nails driven in, into his hands and feet. We're looking at the one who was flogged for us. So when we turn and look at him, we're looking at the judge who took the punishment for the accused. You see that? So you, you can have this metaphor or that one. You're the accused, and if you turn and face him, you're looking at the one who took your place. So this is the foundational issue. Christ either undertakes for you and does so as one kind of judge, or he overtakes you, doing so as the other kind of judge. Christ either undertakes for you as one kind of vindicating judge, or he overtakes you as the judge in a criminal trial. Do you want to look on the face of a merciful judge? Then you must repent. You must turn around. You must Look upon his face. You must say, Lord, I want to look into the eyes of Jesus Christ. I want to turn and look him full in the face. We are preaching the gospel which reveals the face of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. The face of Jesus Christ. We're declaring the face of Jesus Christ. If you look him in the face and he says, turn around, repent, Drop all your complaints. Drop all your quarrels. Any of your reasonable quarrels, any of your, you're the plaintiff after all. If you, if you turn, you're the plaintiff. But drop all your complaints. Any of them that are reasonable, he will pick up. Any of your complaints, any of your charges, any of your issues that are your, where you're, you were right, you're in the right. He's not going to let those float away. He's not going to let the, he's going to pick them up. He's going to deal with them. He is the kind vindicating judge. Or do you want the other kind of judge? Do you want the face of a merciful judge? Then you must repent. You must turn around. You must look upon his face. If you want the other kind of judge, and no one in their right mind does, you intend to continue running away from him. 
running pell-mell through all your slippery sins, you who are stuck in the miry clay, do you think you can make your escape? You're not facing him. You're running from him. Do you really think that you have the competence to successfully run from absolute justice? Do you actually think that you can run for the border? There is no border. We're talking about God. We're talking about the infinite, omnipresent, omniscient God, and you're not facing him, and you think, I'm going to run, for the, I'm going to run to the place where he has no jurisdiction. There is no such place. The place you are running to is called the outer darkness for a reason, and the outer darkness has no shape. There are no, everything, Christ is king everywhere. Christ is the ruler everywhere. So everything boils down to this. It's which way you're facing. Are you facing him in faith, or are you turned away from him in unbelief? The rebellious option is to flee and to feel necessarily the iron clasp of an avenging judge grip your shoulder. Or you might turn around as the gospel commands and see both of his hands outstretched, palms up, extended toward you, and pierced clean through. That's ultimately the only decision in your life that matters at all. Everything else, all, all of your other decisions, all of your other choices, all of your other pursuits can be fit underneath that choice, whichever way it goes. Everything is either put right because you turned and faced him, or it's not because you refused to. It boils down to this, yes or no. Christ is there. Christ is the judge. That's not optional. Yes or no determines what kind of judge. Yes or no de determines which way it's going to go. 